Okay, sure. So hi everyone. So uh, this is uh, Xin Jing. So I'm currently an assistant professor at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University. I'm mainly working on uh, networking and uh, distributed systems. And uh, my uh, current research is mainly about how we can exploit uh, the, uh, the emerging program switches to build uh, advanced systems functionalities. And this is my student Han. Han, why don't you maybe say a few words about it all yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hang Zhu, and uh, I'm a third year PhD student at uh, Johns Hopkins University, uh, advised by uh, Professor Xin Jin. And uh, my research focused on the uh, programmable network and the hardware software to design uh, in distrib distributed systems. Yeah, so uh, today uh, Han is uh, going to uh, talk about uh, our recent work on neural packet classification. So we all know that uh, packet classification is a very uh, fundamental problem in computer uh, networks. And there has been uh, two decades of research on these problems. And uh, people have designed many, many theories that try to build efficient data structures that is optimize the memory speed, uh, the, the classification speed, the memory consumption, or a combination of both. And in our project, we show that by leveraging recent advancements in deep reinforcement learning, we are able to achieve superhuman performance on packet classification, just as uh, uh, other researchers have already did in other domains, such as playing Go or Atari games. And we show that uh, similar ideas can be applied to networking problems and uh, beat many of the uh, handcrafted uh, heuristics designed by human experts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's share the. Uh, okay, so today I'm gonna uh, present the- Are they looking, are they, do they see this or this? I'm not sure. Yeah, we're seeing the next slide and notes as well as the current slide. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why don't you show the- Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, so today I'm gonna present the neural packet classification. Uh, so first, what is a packet classification? Uh, it's a fundamental problem in the computer networking, and uh, it's a building block for access control, quality of service, uh, defense against the attacks, and so on. Uh, one way to think about it is uh, to regard this as a router or firewall, and uh, we want to match on the incoming packets uh, against uh, uh, maybe hundreds of tens uh, hun hundreds of thousands of rules and yeah you can actually you can this. Yeah. oh yeah 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 looks mm -hmm. better and uh, the challenge here is uh, we have to do this at a very high speed and uh, here we uh, give a very simple packet classifier example. Uh, in such packet classifiers, there are three rules. And uh, as we can see, every rule has a priority. Uh, here, the, the first rule with the highest priority too. And uh, we can have different ways to do the match. Uh, we have the exact match here. Uh, we check the source IP address uh, equals uh, 10.0.0.0. And uh, we can also do the range match. Uh, and uh, we can also do the wildcard match. Uh, so hard, how hard is this problem? Uh, it's not like a, a prefix matching. Uh, actually, it's similar to a well-known uh, theoretical point location problem. Uh, and uh, one way to think about it is uh, here we have a two-dimensional space. And uh, there are six rules, R0, R1, R2, R3, R4, and R5. Uh, given a packet header, uh, 
and we can see it matches R1 and R2. And here the R2 has a priority. So the problem has a very hard time space trade off. Uh, here are some theoretical uh, results. Uh, so if you want to achieve the log n time, uh, the space consumption should be uh, the n to the power of d. And uh, if you want a linear space consumption, uh, on space, uh, you you got a, a log n to the power of d time. So typically, uh, n is about uh, 100k and d equals five. Uh, so it may it makes the case uh, pretty bad. Uh, so the rules uh, in the packet classifier have priorities and it can overlap in the uh, hyperspace, uh, which makes the problem even harder. Uh, first, let's review some of the, uh, let's review the existing solutions. Uh, so in the hardware-based side, uh, people tend to use uh, TCAM to do the packet classification very fast. Uh, but for some large classifiers, uh, the power and the cost cost would be very high. Uh, uh, and uh, on the software-based side, uh, uh, it's all about how to build a multi-dimensional classification tree, uh, really a k-dimensional index. Uh, the goal of the software-based solutions uh, is to optimize for uh, two main objectives. The first one is the access time, uh, which is the number of DRAM accesses when you want to match on a packet header. And the second one is the memory, uh, which is the total memory uh, you need to store the tree. And the, both of them are also the metrics we care about in this uh, project, in the neural cuts. Uh, there has been 20 years of research in the classification. Uh, one of the earliest uh, software-based uh, uh, solution is uh, high cuts in 1999. And uh, we also have uh, hypercuts, uh, if cuts, and uh, cut rate. Uh, one thing to note here is that all these algorithms are engineered with uh, hand-tuned heuristics uh, targeting different objectives. Uh, which is brittle. Uh, for example, the high cost and the hyper cost are uh, high cost and the hyper cost tend to build very fast trees, but uh, somehow they will consume enormous amounts of memory. Uh, so if it cost and the cut split is uh, trying to find a more balanced objective between the time and the memory used. Uh, um, so here we are gonna uh, revisit this problem in a different take uh, using reinforcement learning. Uh, in general, uh, the the reinforcement learning reinforcement learning's goal is to uh, train an agent to take some actions in an environment, and uh, the agent takes the state as a an input. Uh, in some cases, the state could be very complex. Uh, say if we want to train the agent to play the space invaders, the, the state, uh, the input of the agent uh, could be a complex image. And uh, here the agent takes the uh, action, move left, uh, and the environment will give a feedback. Uh, and it also assigns the reward, uh, which is plus one point in this case, and it closes the interactive uh, loop. Uh, we, as a neural class, uh, use the reinforcement learning to synthesize a classification tree. Uh, one advantage here is uh, it's deployable for real. Uh, we build the tree in the simulation, uh, but the artifact uh, generated by the RL can be deployed directly to the production uh, environment. Uh, our neural cost, our proposed neural cost algorithm uh, frames building packet classification trees uh, as an uh, reinforcement learning environment. Uh, 
uh, and uh, it turns out that deep reinforcement learning will let us build the build a significantly faster packet class pairs. Uh, at a high level, the neural class takes the packet classification rules as input, and uh, an agent with RL uh, will be trained. And uh, the output is an optimized tree data structure. And uh, this uh, data structure can be an artifact that can be deployed into a production directly, uh, for example, a router. Uh, someone may ask, uh, why reinforcement learning? Uh, so our observation uh, is that uh, almost all the existing uh, software-based solutions are based on some greedy heuristics. Uh, for example, uh, someone may want to, want to maximize the split entropy. Uh, someone may want to balance the, uh, some metrics like the time versus the memory used, and so on. Uh, but uh, reinforcement learning can do better than such greedy approaches uh, because it models the long-term outcomes for, of actions, and uh, it can optimize directly for the end objective. Uh, also, heuristic, uh, historically efficient uh, reinforcement learning formalization can lead to uh, superhuman performance. Uh, such as a well-known alpha zero, alpha star. And another question may be, uh, why not an end-to-end -end solutions? Uh, we can train our machine learning based model and uh, infer which rule should be matched uh, given a package. Uh, the advantage here is uh, straightforward. Uh, so if we do an end-to-end -end solution by a machine learning based uh, uh, model, we don't need to build any data structure at all. Uh, but there are many cons here. Uh, so the very large space of the inputs, uh, which is a packet headers, uh, means it's very hard to check the model correctness. And uh, we also need a very, maybe we also need a very large model to get good errors. Uh, for large packet class pairs. And the packet inference cost may be too high. So we may need some specialized inference hardware like GPU or something else. Uh, and uh, then uh, it's how the, how the building process of the packet classification tree. Uh, first, uh, we can do a node cutting. Uh, say here uh, in the left uh, figure, we have the six rows, and uh, in the right is the initial state of the decision tree, uh, which there is, uh, where there is only one root node. Uh, and uh, we can see it's very uh, time consuming if we want to do a if we want to match a packet, we have to scan all the six rules in this root node. And uh, somehow we can make the situation better by cutting the, uh, cutting the node to, into two, uh, four slices along the X dimension. Uh, and uh, we end up getting uh, four more sub nodes and uh, every node has uh, three rules. Uh, and we can note that the R0, uh, R2, R3, and uh, R5 uh, are only presented once uh, in such a uh, subnode. But uh, for the raw R1 and the R4, uh, these two rows are replicated in every uh, subnode. Uh, so that's part of the reason why the packet classification problem is hard because, because of the uh, rule replication. And for the next step, uh, we may want to cut along the y-axis uh, into, into two slices. 
And uh, here we get more sub nodes here. And uh, since every leaf node contains uh, no more than two rows, uh, we can regard the process uh, to be finished. Uh, how to avoid the uh, row replication? One common way to do this is to do uh, row partition. Uh, here we can see uh, before we doing the uh, node cutting, we can do a partition at first. Uh, we partition the row site to uh, partition one, uh, which only contains a uh, small uh, rows, and the partition two contains uh, uh, large rows. And uh, we can get two decision trees here. Uh, one shortcut, uh, one trade off here uh, is straightforward. Uh, say if we want to do it, to do a packet classification at one time, uh, we need to go through two uh, trees. Uh, one is for the partition one, and another one is for uh, partition two. So, in summary, most the existing software based algorithms build on these two actions uh, node cut and uh, row partition. And uh, the trick here is uh, how to determine exactly how to cut or partition, partition uh, the tree. And uh, that's where the heuristics come in. Uh, people are trying to exploit the problem structure, structure uh, to determine the right action to take. And uh, now we are adapting the reinforcement learning for building cl uh, packet classification tree. And uh, the environment uh, mainly includes the packet packet classifier and the partially built state of the design tree. Uh, actually, uh, the challenge here is how to define the input and the output of the environment. Uh, it's not uh, the neural network in the agent itself. Uh, and our first attempt is to uh, regard such process of building the tree as a naive MDP. Uh, and uh, we need to assume some uh, order at first. Uh, actually, it's, uh, it doesn't matter too much here. Uh, we just use a DFS. Uh, you can use BFS as well. Uh, the action is to cut or partition the current node. Uh, here is a simple example. The initial state S0, there is only one root node, N, N0. And uh, we take action A1. Uh, we got a two sub node here. And the current active node uh, will be changed to N1. And we take action A2. Uh, we got a three more sub node here, N3, N4, and N5. And we repeated this. Uh, until we are satisfied with the uh, uh, decision tree. Then we can calculate the reward. The reward uh, considers the, the depth of the tree and the size of, and the, size of the tree. And uh, we negate this value because we want to minimize, uh, minimize the value. Uh, so what are the challenges here? The first challenge is the size of the state grows with each step. Uh, if you want to encode the, the, all the state of the partially uh, built design tree. Uh, and the second one is the rewards are delayed uh, until end. Uh, suppose uh, the n equals uh, 1000 k, and maybe it uh, takes 1 million steps until we get a satisfying uh, design tree, uh, which means we can only calculate the rewards after one million steps. Uh, and in such case, the agent, the reinforcement agent, uh, needs to learn to understand the complex state and, uh, the, and uh, the attribute of, uh, of the attribution of the reward is weak. Uh, which means the learning signal is too high of errors. 
So uh, what do we do about these challenges? Uh, we have some optimizations. The first optimization uh, is based on the observation that node states are actually independent of the parents or the sibling nodes. Uh, say in the current state S2, actually we only care about the N3. We don't care about the N4, N5 or the parent node N1. Um, so we can represent the state S2 as a fixed length vector, uh, which describes the N3's bonding hypercube. Uh, we can put the minimum and the maximum value uh, for every dimension. And the second optimization uh, is that we regard the building this tree as a branching decision process, not a sequential MDP. And we calculate the rewards, not by mean over time, but uh, aggregate across tree branches. Uh, suppose this is a final state, and uh, how do we calculate the total reward uh, for the root node? And zero. Uh, at first, if we uh, regard this as a sequential decision process, uh, after the rollout is done, uh, we can calculate the reward of N two uh, being negative three, because the depth of the of N two is three, and we want to minimize the depth, so we assign the reward uh, negative three. Um, and if we take the temporal discount uh, into consideration, we can get such reward. Uh, we can see there is a ON step delay between the action and the reward, uh, which means the action attribution is very weak. Uh, but on the other hand, if we uh, take the, uh, if we regard the building the tree as a branching decision process, uh, at first, we can assign the reward of every leaf node uh, in the decision tree uh, to be negative one. And uh, we do a um, minimum aggregation over the children, and we also take, take the interior node's uh, contribution to the reward as, uh, as well. So when we calculate the reward of N1, uh, we do a minimum aggregation over uh, its children, uh, its minus um, negative one, and uh, and its uh, its uh, its own influence on the reward is also negative one. So the reward of n one is negative two, and uh, the reward of n zero is negative three. And we can see. Uh, by doing this, there's only O log N delay between the action and the reward. Uh, then we can define the learning program. Uh, the action space is about uh, either you do a cutting or partitioning uh, upon a node. If you are cutting, uh, the agent needs to choose the dimension to cut and how many pieces to cut into. And you, if you are partitioning, uh, the reinforcement learning agent needs to specify heuristic to use uh, or dimension and the threshold uh, to partition. And for the observation space, uh, we can encode the node states as a binary string, uh, as the previous slides shows. And we can also encode the partitioning state in a similar way. Uh, we can can also encode some allowed actions. Uh, for example, you may not want to allow uh, the partition in other nodes except for the root node. And uh, then we implemented the neural cuts by proximal policy optimization, optimization algorithms. Uh, such algorithm has been proved uh, successful in many domains. And uh, actually the algorithm used is not fundamental though. Uh, you can use some other uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. And the neural cost is also amenable to parallelism uh, 
we use the parallel of the shelf uh, PBO implementation from the RLLib uh, to uh, accelerate the training process. Uh, for the evaluation, we evaluate the neural cuts on class bench. Class bench is a standard benchmark for packet classifier performance. And uh, there are some, uh, and there are synthetic packet classifiers uh, ranging from 1000 to 100K rows in size uh, based on access control list, uh, firewall, and every chain row size. Uh, we compare the neural cuts against uh, high cuts, hyper cuts, if cuts, and cut speed. Cut speed. Uh, they are not random baselines. Uh, they have many uh, hundreds of citations, except uh, for the cut speed, cut speed uh, which is pretty new. Uh, at first, we uh, tell the neural cuts to optimize uh, upon the time. Uh, here the x axis shows four uh, echo row sites from the class bench. Uh, and the bar uh, the y axis shows the uh, time in the worst case, uh, which is the uh, depth of the tree. So the lower is the better. And the neural cost is shown in the black bar. And uh, we can see the neural cost perform performance significantly better than the other state-of-art uh, software-based uh, algorithms. Does it scale? Uh, yes. Uh, here we show the classification time uh, upon all the data sets in the class bench. And the summary we can get is uh, the neural class can get a 18% medium time improvement over all baselines. Uh, for the next uh, evaluate, uh, next experiment, we tune the neural cuts to uh, optimize upon the space, uh, the memory used. And uh, we can get a summary uh, that neural cuts can is able to get up to three X better memory over all baselines. Uh, however, cut speed is somewhat better uh, at the medium. Uh, besides that, uh, neural cuts can also leverage existing heuristics. Uh, here, uh, we compare neural cuts with uh, if cuts, and uh, we can get uh, up to uh, 10 X space improvement and we can see we don't lose anything in time. Uh, this, this slide shows some uh, intuition about how neural class works. Uh, suppose the current node is N3 and the, the RL agent can see the uh, current state uh, represented by the bit stream code. And uh, it takes the bit string as an input uh, and uh, let it go through a fully collect uh, uh, neural network. Here is a uh, two layer, uh, 256 unit uh, fully connected layers. And it will output an action distribution pi A against S. Uh, it will show uh, which dimension you prefer and uh, the number of cuts you want to uh, take and uh, the action tab, uh, which means uh, if you want to do a cut, cutting or partitioning. And uh, it applies such, and then the agent uh, samples and concrete action from the action distribution and applies such action to the, uh, to the tree. And we repeat until done. Uh, on the right, we show the visualization of a, uh, of a tree generated on the echo four 
uh, 1K raw site. Uh, the X axis shows the level of tree. So we can see the, this is a 12 level trees, 12 level tree. And uh, the Y axis uh, is the number of nodes at every level. Uh, the color shows the dimension of the, uh, which dimension is a, is a node uh, cut out. Uh, and we can see uh, the remaining, uh, remaining cut on the red dimension, which is the destination IP. Uh, here we show uh, the different, uh, some different uh, trees generated by a well-trained uh, reinforcement learning agent. Uh, we can see they are all different looking. Uh, and uh, the first tree is a, is a tree from the previous slides. And uh, we can see for the uh, three other trees, uh, the agent tends to cut in more on the blue and the green, uh, which is the source IP and the destination port. Uh, that means uh, we actually don't care about the, the, the agent itself. Uh, we mainly care about the artifact generated by the agent. Actually, we can throw away the agent after the training is finished. Uh, and it allows the agent to explore benefits of different choices. Uh, one may can resemble uh, for several times to get uh, even better trees after the training process is finished. Uh, okay, how, so how does the learning progress? Uh, the ob observation we had in our experiments is that uh, for most classifiers, there exists a simple random distribution uh, over actions that can generate a reasonable tree. Uh, the, uh, we can have a simple interpretation here. Uh, we can think of the learning as happening in two phases. The, the phase one, uh, it goes from a poorly formed tree to learning a reasonable initial solutions. And the phase two, uh, we leverage the modeling capacity of the neural network uh, to converge to an optimized solution. Uh, at last is uh, our conclusion. Uh, we introduce a tractable reinforcement learning formulation of the packet classification problem. Uh, and our results uh, beat state-of-the-art uh, baselines uh, in important dimensions, uh, like 18% medium improvement in time over all baselines. And uh, neural class can uh, get up to 3x improvement in time and space over all baselines. And in the future, maybe neural cuts can be applied to some other data structures uh, with complex performance heuristics. Uh, for example, the indexing for special uh, databases. Yeah, that would be all. Thanks. Okay, so that's all. Are there any uh, questions that people want to ask? Uh, thanks for the talk. This is Hong Xiang from Alibaba. Um, okay. One question of mine is, uh, can you tell us some kind of concrete application uh, scenarios of this system? Actually, I don't quite understand how uh, packet classification being used in, in real life. And uh, also, uh, what's the scope people use to classify packets? Is it based on the you know destination or just IP IP layer or based on the you know the deep content of the packets? So could you give us some background? Yeah. You can say first. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so here is a simple example. 
uh, see if you want to uh, install several, so maybe uh, hundreds of case uh, rules uh, for the firewall. You want to match on some uh, source IP and uh, destination IP, or uh, so more general, you want to match on the five tuple, and uh, you want to take different actions if the uh, packet header matches some uh, hypercube in the uh, five dimensional uh, hyperspace. Uh, so when a packet uh, comes to the like uh, a router and uh, you want to uh, figure out uh, which rule with the highest priority it matches and then you can take some uh, actions like uh, you deny, you drop the packet or you uh, forward the packet based on the basic IPv4 routing. Uh, so we want to do it in a very high speed because uh, it's at runtime, the packets come maybe at a very high speed and there are many, maybe there are hundreds of thousands of rules you want to install on the router. Yeah, for example, in some uh, software switches such as OpenV switch, we have done some measurements and if you have a, a large number of rules in software switches such as OpenV switch, the performance is really bad, and you can leverage neural cards to build efficient classification trees that can be used by those software switches to speed up the packet processing if they have a large number of echo rules or firewall rules. Yeah, that will be a very concrete uh, uh, use case that you can actually uh, try and deploy neural cards in practice. So do you mean that it, it can be used for compressing the the space of the rule or, 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 or it yeah, it can be both used to uh, speed up the, the 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 packet processing. I mean, process and also reduce the memory uh, consumption. Okay. Yeah, because today uh, they they will build a very large data structure, and uh, when we have hundreds of thousands of rows. Uh, you, you cannot achieve, you, you cannot process millions of packets per second on those software-based switches. And we also tried the default uh, DPTK implementation of Intel that we, we have a current project on this. And it can support no more than 50,000 rules. Yeah. And by using uh, our solution, you can build a very efficient, uh, uh, very efficient trees that has a small memory footprint and can, uh, can achieve what millions of packets per second processing speed. Uh, yeah, hi, hi Xian. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm Anand. Uh, this is not quite my area, but you know, I'm kind of curious about the the, mot the motivation and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, how how important the, the packet classification is? I mean, you know, this, this is not my area. Maybe it's just a stupid question. But so, if if I do not care too much about the efficiency of the packet classification, what will happen? So, for example, think about the say reliability for the cloud, you know, the cloud services, right? So if, if I have a failure, right, the company will lose the money. So that's a big problem. But for packet, you know, packet classification, say I have a not quite very efficiency for the you know, packet classification, what will happen? I mean, what, what bad things will happen and, and why I you know, need to care about so much about the, the efficiency? So for many clouds, they deploy, they have very large classifiers for access control list or firewall rules. And many of those access control list rules or firewall rules are deployed in, in the virtual switches, in the software switches. And if the software switch is very slow, then it will hurt the performance of the internet service that the people are running in the cloud. Mm, yeah, I, yeah I, 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 I agree with this scenario, but you know, yeah, I may, maybe I'm not quite familiar with this, but uh, I never heard <coughs> our operators or customers complain your firewall you know room match action has the very slow th problem or you know i never heard any complaint about that yeah or that's part of, the, that's part of that they never try to put a, a lot of rules in it because they know yeah. that if they put a lot of rules the performance will suck and they were not able to meet the slos of the applications so actually a follow a following question is right. uh, do you guys compare it with the, you know, kind of a formal, kind of a formal method, use formal method to compress the fire, firewall rules? So 
there will be so I agree that in, maybe in real life in the firewalls in the software router there will there will be a lot of rules, uh, and uh, there will be a, a, a lot of redundancy, and you can you know significantly simplify it if you you have some method, and the one method is that of course you classify the online packets and the de decide which route to hit first, and you build a tree, right? So this is what you're doing, but. Have you compare with you, know, you? You another one is that you can use formal method to transform the original ACL set to a smaller set that that has the equivalent kind of uh, lo logic with the original one. You yeah, know? I think that's a good direction. But uh, uh, now we are comparing with several heuristics which are state of the art solutions on uh, how you can build the efficient uh, classification trees. But I think the thing you mentioned is kind of orthogonal. So they are like how you can uh, doing some transformations on the row sets to make them smaller. So that uh, I think that's something we can look into as the future work. Yeah, even you compress this uh, rules, you can still apply our neural cost to the compress the row set and build a more efficient decision tree. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, this is Molly from Princeton University. Um, mm -hmm. I actually have a question about the technology side of it. So you mentioned that, um, I think in the last few slides, like you leverage the uh, modeling capacity of the neural network to converge to an optimized solution. I just wondered, does that mean like underlying the reinforcement learning Basically, your agent is using some neural network in order to learn the optimal policy. Is that what is going on here? Because you mentioned neural network, and I don't really understand like what this means in the um, scenario of reinforcement learning. Uh, yes, the agent uh, contains, uh, so in our case, it's a two-layer fully connected uh, neural network. and. Uh, uh, so the input of the neural network is a uh, current state. So in our cases, it's a bit string, and it outputs uh, uh, an action distribution. And uh, you can use some uh, softmax or other function to sample from the uh, action distribution uh, to a concrete action. And uh, it applies the concrete action to the environment, and uh, the environment will uh, get a new state and you repeat such process until, until done. I see. Uh, I think this is an in interesting application in terms of that like you solely focus on like one set of rules and then like you optimize the best solution um, based on the existing rules. So I'm just wondering like I think like for other applications it can be possible that you want to Got some best policy, and you want to apply it to other use cases. Do you have any thoughts about that? Like for other network functions, can you what changes do you need to do on the reinforcement learning in order to, in order for it to work? Uh, I think that in our case, uh, we actually don't care about the agent itself too much. Uh, it's it's not like the typical reinforcement learning training. Uh, uh, here we only care about the artifact generated by the agent. So, uh, so we can train an agent to be very good, good at the uh, training one single classifier, and uh, we get such uh, artifact generated by the agent. Uh, even we can even throw away the agent after the training process is finished because we care about the artifact generated by the agent much more than the agent itself. So that's not the normal case in like other reinforcement learning scenario. I'm just like not familiar with this area. I just wonder like, is this always the case in reinforcement learning or like in other area, like people do care about the agent? Yes, you're right. Here we don't care about the agent. Okay. Yeah, for example, you are, if you are training an agent to play Go or play games, you still need an agent to play the games for you. Mm -hmm. But here, we use the agent to train the classifier. Then mm -hmm. after the agent outputs the classifier, you can just use the classifier to do the 
package classification, you don't need the agent anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that, makes yeah, sense. That's the difference, yeah. Yeah, sure, thanks. Okay, so are there any other questions? Okay, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending this webinar. And uh, if you have further uh, questions, uh, feel free to email us. And also uh, the code is open source online and uh, you and it's uh, uh, easy to use and you can, uh, you can go to GitHub and to play with the code.